Welcome to Exhibition and Xbox Podcast, episode number 91. My name is Samuel Adams, and we are hitting it early this morning, 5.30 a.m. The coffee is flowing just like the gaming news because we have a lot to dig into on today's show. Microsoft has said including a game on Game Pass can lead to a reduction in base game sales. Seems kind of obvious, but we'll get into it more in a moment. Ubisoft has also said they'll attend to you three if it happens. What do you mean if? And Sonic Frontier sales greatly exceeded expectations. We've got all of these stories and more on today's show. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it. Before we get into the meat of today's show, I want to talk about a change I've made in my personal gaming life that I think might be applicable for a lot of you out there as well, and that is that I've tried to break the hold that live service games have had on me. Because you all know very well if you've been with the show for a while, I love my Halo Infinite, I love my Battlefield 2042, Modern Warfare 2 is a great Call of Duty, and all three of these games have had their hold on me with either daily challenges or weekly rewards or battle passes, whatever it might be, these engagements that developers have baked into these games that are designed to keep players coming back for more have absolutely had a vice grip on my gaming time over the course of the past year or two years, but really the past six months, I found myself constantly sitting down every time when I boot up my Xbox and feeling compelled to grind a battle pass because the season's ending and I've got to work on finishing it. I I've got to get that weekly reward because the reset day is coming and I've got to lock in that new camo or that new skin that quite frankly, I'm never even going to see in game ever because it's a first person game. I'm talking about you, Halo Infinite. Uh, and so I have always felt compelled to get these rewards. And over the past couple of weeks, I have said, no, I am pushing the reset button. I am breaking out of the mold whenever I sit down to play a game and I'm going to play something that is new, that is fresh, that I want to play and experience and bring in new ideas into my gaming life. Uh, and so I intentionally went back and dug into the Game Pass catalog, into my backlog, and I pulled out a couple of games that I've wrapped up over the past week or so or that I'm working on now. And the first was Somerville uh, that dropped in December that had a big market marketing push, but I think that I am like a lot of you, where once the marketing run is done from Team Xbox, uh, once the game has faded from the public podcast conversation, it falls to the wayside. So I checked out Somerville, got every achievement in the game, a pretty fun little time, reminiscent of Inside and Limbo, and I enjoyed my time with that one. Then I moved on to Crisis Remastered. I'd started the campaign a couple of years back, never got around to finishing it, booted it up, kind of finagled with the mechanics a bit to remember how the controls feel and wrapped up that campaign. Great time, no complaints, really enjoyed my time with it. And it definitely has a callback to that mid 2000s shooter at its core with a new coat of paint on it that makes it look much better for the modern day. But then I got into Outriders. Okay, so Outriders launched into Game Pass a couple of years ago. I played it for maybe an hour or two and then I put it down. It wasn't what I wanted then and there. But now that I've gone back to it, it has absolutely had a vice grip on me once again. I love this game. I sat down and started playing it on Thursday evening, I think. I played it for five hours straight until like one o'clock in the morning. Friday pretty much did the same thing. Played a bit yesterday when I had time. Uh, and in fact, I loved it so much that on Saturday I went out to GameStop and I was just browsing around. I found a copy of Outriders World Slayer, which is the DLC and the base game combo on clearance for 15 bucks. Got 30% off, used a $5 coupon, locked that bad boy in for $7.50. Absolutely enjoying every second of it. If you enjoy Gears of War, if you enjoy The Division and Destiny 2, it brings in elements from all three of those games and packs it into one little package. And I say little package, there's a lot of content in there. And so that's the big lesson. That's the big takeaway is that stepping back from the live service games and just getting back to enjoying games, playing through experiences, finishing something. It's felt so good for me uh, that I would highly recommend if you are feeling like you're in kind of a gaming rut and you don't have anything to play or you're just going through the rhythm uh, of the gaming week, take a step back. 
play something new, dig into Game Pass, because it is an incredible discovery engine. And I think the marketing run that Microsoft and Xbox have for Game Pass can often bring so many games into the service, but leave them forgotten a week or two after they're launched on the service. And so definitely dig in. Don't just play what's at the top of the catalog, what's new, uh, but really play through some of those older titles because you'll really, really have some good times. Now, moving on to the main topic of today's show, Microsoft has found that including a game on Xbox Game Pass reduces the base game sales for 12 months following the game's inclusion on Game Pass. And that's pulled directly from the CMA's provisional findings, where Microsoft disclosed some internal analysis to help contextualize how Game Pass can actually impact games long term. Now, let's get back to the statement there. Including a game on Game Pass reduces base game sales. Water is wet. I don't know what else you want me to say there, because as somebody who subscribes to Game Pass and who has for years now, I'm not going to buy the base game if it is on the service. Why would I buy a movie if it's on Netflix? I don't understand the process here uh, because, yes, that is obvious. I'm not going to do that. That being said, context matters here. Number one. The percentage of decline has been redacted. Is it 90? Is it 10? Is it 20? That's something that we really have to consider here. Additionally, what does DLC look like for the games that are included on Game Pass? Because as somebody who plays a lot of games on Game Pass, I have been more prone to buy DLC for games that are on there because I want more of the game. I want to dig into it deeper. And so I might not have bought the DLC had I just bought the base game. Maybe I didn't get as invested in it, whatever it might be. I think DLC sales would be interesting to look at as well. Uh, but beyond all of that, I also think about the discoverability of these games because the financial side of the business is something that I am not privy to. But for games like potentially Ghost Song is one that comes to mind, which is a Metroidvania style game that hit the service, is available now on Game Pass and is big in the indie community. I know a lot of people enjoy that one. But it's one that I personally never would have heard of. And so my question would be uh, for the developers, is the deal that Microsoft cut more than you would have made from base sales of the game had there not been that big marketing push of it being included on Game Pass. Because we all hear about the Descenders guy and how he talks about how uh, Game Pass helped his game come into the limelight. He continues to make money from the game thanks to Game Pass, etc. I would want to hear from other developers about how Game Pass has impacted the reception and long-term success of their game. Because I never would have heard of Ghost Song had it not been included on Game Pass. The same thing could have been said for Somerville as well, as we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. Uh, it is a discovery engine, and so I would say that for a lot of these very small indies, the inclusion in Game Pass is potentially one of the best marketing tools that they've got. Uh, and I know that Microsoft curates what gets included in Game Pass. Many developers would love to be in that spotlight, but they try and keep it clean and keep a service that adds value rather than is just filled with bloatware. Uh, however, I think this statement shows uh, that Microsoft is digging into every aspect of Game Pass because at the end of the day, it's a business that's trying to remain profitable. They want to make money. Uh, and so if base game sales decline over the course of 12 months following their addition on Game Pass, how are they making that up? Also, what games does this statement apply to? Because Phil Spencer said back in 2018, the Game Pass boost game sales. And let's go ahead and shift into that side of the conversation. Because he said back in 2018, quote, when you put a game like Forza Horizon 4 on Game Pass, you instantly have more players of the game, which is actually leading to more sales of the game. You say, well, isn't everyone just going to subscribe for $10 and go play this thing? But no, gamers are finding things to play based on what everybody else is playing. And I think that's still a very important aspect here because what's popular in the public eye is what is going to be a big seller on whatever platform you might play on. Elden Ring drove a ton of conversation and Elden Ring was very popular in 2022. That's not to say the public conversation led to the success of Elden Ring, but it certainly didn't hurt it. And so for a big game like Forza Horizon 4 or more recently Forza Horizon 5, Game Pass is probably a big success for that kind of game because more active players leads to more people talking about the game, which then leads to more friends of the people talking about the game buying the game. Uh, and I think that would still stand true today. 
But for a smaller indie title, it may be much like this statement that we have here, or these findings that we have here, where there is a decline in base game sales following their inclusion on Game Pass. So I think each individual situation changes from game to game. Uh, and also, to say that Phil Spencer is lying, that's a statement that I've seen thrown around, uh, based on a 2018 interview compared with a 2023 finding that is included in the report for the CMA, is just not true. You're really stretching there because any industry shifts over the course of five years. That's a long time in the world of business, no matter what industry you're in. Uh, and I'm sure the Game Pass looks a lot different on the back end business financial side than it did back in 2018. Bigger deals are leading to potential shifts for developers. They had certainly shifted for the players themselves, but it still provided value. So tons of conversation around this. I personally think it got blown out of proportion uh, and there was a, a whole lot to break down there. But nonetheless, uh, Game Pass leads to a decline in base game sales. And once again, I, mean, I don't know what you want me to say. Water's wet. The coffee's hot. We're just going to keep it moving and enjoy those games. Jumping to the next story of today's show, Ubisoft CEO Yuzgemo said the company is going to be at E3 if it happens. What do you mean if, Ease? What does that mean? Because earlier in the month, the ESA said that E3 was full steam ahead, and that came after reports that PlayStation, Nintendo, and Microsoft would not be attending this year's show in any capacity. We're talking press conference or show floor. They're just not going to be there. Again, that's not confirmed, but I think it's pretty understandable that they don't really need it in 2023. Now, Ease Game O came out during an investor call and said, quote, if E3 happens, we will be there and we will have a lot of things to show. So my question is, do you think that E3 could potentially be canceled for 2023? 2023. My personal thoughts are no, I think it's still going to go on. And as we talked about on last week's show, E3 still has a place in the industry. It's just not going to be the premier event anymore. I think that Summer Game Fest has comfortably dethroned E3 with Jeff Keighley adding some personality to the mix and more and more companies getting behind the Summer Game Fest and aligning their schedules with Summer Game Fest. I just don't think E3 has a purpose anymore, uh, but it still has a purpose for potentially indie devs, the AA developers or the AA games that are coming out and putting out these smaller titles that still need some time in the spotlight. E3 could be the spot that they show that stuff off. Uh, now, my question is, if E3 takes that spot, can these smaller indie showcases survive that have cropped up over the years, uh, like the Gorilla Collective, that kind of thing? And so I think these questions will be answered naturally over time, just over the course of events. Uh, but to see Ease Gamo, the CEO of Ubisoft, saying if E3 happens, we'll be there. I think that throws a lot of things into question, because if anybody should be in the know about if it's happening or not, it should probably be him. Apparently, Sonic Frontiers sold very well for Sega. In fact, it greatly exceeded company expectations, according to a recent investor call. They said, quote, the number of units sold greatly exceeded the full year plan at the beginning of the fiscal year, and we recognize that this is a title that we will continue to sell over the long term based on our sales strategies, such as pricing, promotions, and the development of free DLC. Now, when asked to evaluate the quality of Sonic Frontiers based on critic and player reaction, an exec replied, quote, although it is true that the Metascore was slightly lower than expected, we believe that we were able to release a title that has been well received by many people around the world thanks to the extremely high ratings from users. We plan to release the recently announced additional DLC sequentially, and we believe that we can continue to build up repeat sales. In addition, starting with Sonic Prime, which started on Netflix in December, we plan to further expand the Sonic IP in the future, such as the third movie and merchandising." End quote. The Sonic machine has been churning over the past few years. As the exec mentions, uh, we've got the Sonic Netflix show. We've got two very successful movies, uh, which feature Jim Carrey as well. Uh, love Jim Carrey. Uh, and to be able to see a successful game come out of that as well, I think we're really getting into kind of a golden age of Sonic. Uh, of course, that's a very controversial statement. There have been plenty more successful Sonic games in the past. Everybody talks about Sonic 06. I'm staying out of that conversation, uh, but it is cool to see Sonic Frontiers get some recognition here. And I think this tier of game is one that I want to see more of. Not saying that I want to see uh, 
lower quality games, not to say that Sonic Frontiers is lower quality, but not every game has to be a 10. Not every game has to be a narrative adventure that brings tears to my eyes. Sometimes a game can just be a game and sometimes a game can just be fun and you can just sit down and enjoy it. Uh, and if it's if there's fun to be had, players will find it. And I think the players found the fun uh, with Sonic Frontiers. I know that's something that Luke Lore on the uh, Xbox Expansion Pass talked about earlier this year. Find the fun. Not every Everything has to be found fun by the public as long as you're having a good time with it. That's all that matters. Uh, and I think that's what fans of Sonic have done with Sonic Frontiers. They have dug in, they have found the fun, and they are talking about it. And that's driving some sales. Uh, so congrats to Sega and the team behind Sonic Frontiers. Looking forward to seeing more in the future. Wild Hearts dropped last week across all major platforms, and this was a big release for Electronic Arts in 2023. It's developed by a team called Omega Force, published by EA under the EA Originals branding. And for me personally, the ratings were much higher than I expected them to be. Looking over to GameSpot.com for the review roundup for Wild Hearts, you've got GameSpot themselves with an 8 out of 10. Games Radar gives it a 4 out of 5. IGN gives it an 8 out of 10 as well, alongside Destructoid with another 8 out of 10. Push Square also gives it an 8 out of 10, and The Guardian gives it a 3 out of 5. Overall, pretty good reception for something that is a Monster Hunter-like. It is literally following that exact same formula, uh, and it seems like it does it really well. I know that I've seen some people on my timeline sharing some game clips, and while it's not a game that speaks to me, uh, it does look like it nails that formula, and I think that what I've heard is that it's a bit more accessible than the traditional Monster Hunter game typically is, because Monster Hunter has a tendency uh, to definitely have some complex mechanics that may not be welcoming to newcomers. Not not to say that Wild Hearts is really going to be uh, your baby's first monster hunter, but it is going to be the Bloodborne for the Dark Souls. It is going to be something that's easier to pick up and get into versus getting into Elden Ring for the first time and not knowing where to go. Uh, so I think it's cool to see this type of product into the market. And I think for EA specifically as an EA published title. It's good to see them continuing to invest in things that break them out of the first-person shooter genre that Electronic Arts got known for pretty well uh, over the course of the last 10 years or so. Because when I think about Electronic Arts, typically I would think about Titanfall, I would think about Battlefield, that kind of thing. And now I'm starting to think about It Takes Two. I'm starting to think about Wild Hearts. Like Those kind of games break the narrative and change things up for EA. Uh, and I would love to see them continue to invest in this, and I think that you will. So if you do want to check out Wild Hearts, looks like one uh, that is getting some pretty good marks across the board if you're into Monster Hunter. If you enjoyed Monster Hunter Rise on Game Pass, potentially, uh, this should be one you check out. And you can pick it up for 70 bucks on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. To wrap up today's show, we've got two stories to touch on. First, Dead Island 2 is launching one week early, if you really want to call it that. Uh, now coming out on April 21st, as compared to its original release of April 28th. Uh, now, the April 28th release date was actually a delay because the game was supposed to launch on February 3rd, but then April 28th was announced to be the new date for Star Wars Jedi Survivor. So while it wasn't called out explicitly, it does seem like Dead Island 2 moved forward one week to avoid being cannibalized pun very much so intended uh, by Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I personally think that's still pretty close in proximity to Star Wars Jedi Survivor, but Dead Island 2 has been a long time coming, and it's nice to see it coming out in general in 2023. I've seen some screenshots floating around of that game. Looks gorgeous. I mean, shockingly good looking game. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting into it. I don't know if it's going to be a day one for me. But what I'm hoping for from Dead Island 2 is that it does kind of take a step back and it's not quite as uh, RPG heavy as something like Dying Light was or Dying Light 2 is. Uh, it would be nice to see them just get back to having the fun Dead Island slaying experience. You know, I think about Dead Rising a lot because that was in the news earlier this week for a leaked canceled game that hit the Internet. Uh, and I love Dead Rising because it doesn't take itself too seriously. I can just sit down, mindlessly plow through some zombies. That's what I want from Dead Island 2. So if you do want to dive in, coming out on April 21st, the game has gone gold. So no more delays are on the way. And that is always something that is good to see. 
And finally, Valheim has gotten a release date for Xbox Series X and S, and of course it is launching directly into Game Pass, but the game is going to finally land on March the 14th. This is one that was very popular on PC last year, and it is currently available on Game Pass for PC, but now it is going to be launching on Xbox and will bring more players back into the game. So if you enjoy survival, crafting, that kind of thing, uh, you should definitely check out Valheim. Certainly not the prettiest looking game, but the art style lends itself to the experience, I think is the best way to describe it. Uh, check out some gameplay. I know I've got some playing right here beside me, but uh, if you do want to check out Iron Gate Studios Valheim, that one's landing on console on, once again, March the 14th. But that wraps up today's episode of Exhibition, an Xbox podcast. If you enjoyed this one and you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube or your podcast service of choice and get the show delivered to you each and every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, I'm posting news TikToks throughout the week as well as YouTube shorts, so plenty of content no matter where you are. Social links will be down below, and I appreciate the support. It has already been a great year for 2023, and we've got plenty more to come. But I'll catch you guys on the next one. Have a fantastic week, and remember, keep on playing.